Welcome. In this video, I'm going to first cover the substantive merger analysis uh, in terms of the test that we now find in uh, Regulation 139-2004. And then we're going to look at how uh, the analysis of horizontal mergers is conducted under the European Commission Merger Guidelines of 2004. So for the first part, let's look at the substantive test of the EU merger regulation. One of the things to take into account is that there has been an evolution in the substantive test. In the original regulation, the 1989 test was that of the creation or strengthening of a dominant position, together with the second branch of this test, as a result of which effective competition would be significantly impeded in the single market or in the substantial part of it. So we had this two-pronged test in the first merge, merger regulation. This was changed in 2004 when uh, these two branches were merged into a single branch that is the significant impediment to effective competition test. Now, the creation or strengthening of a dominant position is merely an example of how a merger may lead to a significant impediment to effective competition. There was a reason to this change. In the original merger regulation, individual dominance as well as collective dominance were deemed to fall under the test. However, with the uh, Airtour's judgment, the, 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 the General Court held that collective dominance did not include the existence of uh, several firms with market power, with individual market power in the same market. To the uh, General Court, uh, collective dominance meant that we had a cooperative oligopoly where coordinated effects might emerge or the inducement to such co coordinated effects, effects would actually increase following the merger. Now, under the 2004 test, the analysis now is now divided between coordinated effects, which would clearly include what the General Court has held as collective dominance in the Airtour's judgment, but also unilateral effects. Now, unilateral effects will include the creation or strengthening of a dominant position, as that firm in a dominant position might unilaterally exercise market power. But as Recital 25 of the merger regulation also makes clear, this prohibition test now includes anti competitive effects that arise from non coordinated behavior by firms that do not have a dominant position. And so that is why the 2004 test is held to be broader than the earlier test, which excluded some anti possible anti-competitive effects from mergers. Before we go on, just a quick reminder that for joint ventures, um, if there is the likelihood that the joint venture will have the object or effect of coordinating the competitive behavior of the parent companies that remain independent, then such type of effects have to be analyzed under the criteria of Article 101, paragraphs 1 and 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So there's a specific test for those specific types of effects. Going back to the significant impediment to competition test, the, in the Ryanair judgment, the general court is sort of synthesized synthesize the, the type of analysis that has to be conducted. And under the, the court held that a prohibition decision has to be based on the outcome of a prospective analysis carried out by the Commission. And then it went on to elaborate what that prospective analysis is. For the court, this implies an examination of how the notified concentration might alter the factors that determine the state of competition on a given market. In order to establish whether or not a change in these uh, factors would lead to a serious impediment of, to effective competition. This analysis in, requires the Commission to envisage various chains of cause and effect with a view to ascertain which of them are the most likely. So the objective of merger analysis may be uh, shown in a more schematic way by considering the arrow of time 
and the moment the merger occurs. Now we have a first moment, so before the merger, we have why the state of competition before the merger, and then we have to assess what will be the state of competition X after the merger. And so the variation of the state of competition in the market is really the goal for the um, prospective analysis carried out by the Commission. And the question is, does the merger create or strengthen market power vis-à-vis -vis the state of competition Y? If the answer is yes, then we need to establish to what extent does market power increase and what pressures may limit the exercise of market power. So the objective of the merger of merger analysis, as the Commission put it, puts it in the Horizontal Merger Guidelines of 2004, is really to prevent consumers from being denied the benefits of competition through horizontal mergers that significantly increase market power. And why? Well, because market power may allow firms post-merger to increase prices, to reduce production, choice, or quality of goods and services, to reduce innovation, or to influence other comp competition um, parameters. We're now going to look at horizontal mergers and the type of analysis envisaged by the 2004 Horizontal Merger Guidelines of the European Commission. So considering one of the scenarios where we have four um, operators, in this case four hypothetical mobile phone operators, uh, we have Alpha and Beta with a market share of 16.65% each, and Gamma and Delta with a 33.3% market share each. If a merger occurs between Alpha and Beta, Alpha and Beta now have the same market share as the other two competitors. Note that in this case, the perfect symmetry is simply for um, uh, the example. It is not necessary they have exactly the same market share. The idea is simply to say that, to see that if they have approximately the same type of market shares, then very likely their incentives to reach a collusive outcome may be easier to achieve and then if other conditions propose, that um, may lead to, um, to, to collusion occur, then we might have a risk of coordinated effects in addition to the reduction of the number of competitors. So under the horizontal merger guidelines, the Commission conducts what it calls a market power analysis on the base, uh, basis of a number of structural uh, factors. First, we have to define the relevant market. Then we need to calculate the market shares of the firms operating in that relevant market. And finally, we can estimate concentration indexes. In this video, I'm only going to cover this uh, third aspect. Now, there are several types of concentration indexes. The ones that are most commonly used are the concentration ratio, CRX. Uh, for instance, CR4. Um, is the aggregate market share of the four largest firms. So a CR4 of 85% will tell you that the four largest firms hold to 85% of the market. However, con this concentration ratio does not tell you whether there are significant differences in firm size. For instance, one of the firms might have 81% of market share and the remaining three a market share of 1% each. Um, so often we use, and today we use uh, the so-called Huffindahl-Ishman Index, or HHI, which uh, calculates the sum of the square of all firms' market shares. So to give you an example, a market with five firms with these market shares, we uh, sum the square of the market shares and we reach a total of 2,550 points. Now, we have to measure the um, HHI before and after the merger because, remember, we're looking at the changes that would occur should the merger go through. This variation is set as the delta, that is, the factor of variation in the index. The Commission shows how this might be important by looking at some 
broad characterization of markets on the basis of the HHI. So if the HHI is small, lower than a thousand points, the Commission considers that this is an unconcentrated market. If the HHI is equal or above or below 2000 and equal or above 1000 points, then we have a moderately concentrated market. In this case, the Commission considers that a merger may raise concerns if the delta is equal or above 250 points. If the HHI is above 2000 points, that will be considered a concentrated market. And as you can see, competitive concerns may be raised by smaller variations in the HHI. So a variation of 150 or more points is sufficient to give rise to concerns for the Commission. The Commission also uh, admits that it might exceptionally intervene in a concentration in an unconcentrated market, provided one of these factors, one or more of these factors, is involved, such as if the merger involves a potential competitor or a recent competitor with a small market share, uh, and thus it would be sort of nipped in the bud as a type of um, preventive acquisition or killer acquisition. If the merger involves innovative firms whose dynamic importance, for instance, a line of research in a significant cancer treatment area, but that has not yet reached the market, so the market share does not adequately convey um, the, the, the potential of competition by this firm. There might be significant cross-shareholdings among competing firms. The acquisition of a maverick firm, that is to say a firm that behaves in a way that um, disrupts the uh, what would be the established order by incumbent firms. If there has been past evidence of collusion or facilitating practices indicating that there is, before the merger, already a risk of coordinated behavior. And finally, if the pre-merger market share of one of the parties is equal or above 50%, which is, in fact, a mathematical error, because in that case, that um, market share alone would give us uh, an index that would be far above 1,000 points. So... The test of significant impediment to effective competition requires a structural analysis. And why does it require it? Well, because we need to take into account the degree of concentration and its variation as the means to identify the conditions that permit a prognosis on the likely effects of the merger in terms of market power of the firms that are operating in that relevant market. So we need to do this analysis in order to be able to estimate the type of effects that may emerge in the future. These effects may be of one of two types, unilateral effects or uncoordinated effects and coordinated effects. Let's look first at unilateral effects and what they are meant, what they mean. Um, now, unilateral effects are anti-competitive effects that result from the elimination of relevant competitive pressures on the new entities, as well as uh, other firms that constrained its market power before the merger. So unilateral effects apply both to the creation or strengthening of a dominant position, where the firm in a dominant position may, after the merger, have um, achieved or increased market power, but it also applies to oligopolies particularly in markets with product differentiation. Now, why would it be, how would it be possible to have several firms with market power um, being able to exercise, unilaterally exercise market power? Let's look at an example here. So in this example, we have four firms. They have the same market share, 25% before the merger. And what we need to do is to look at what would happen if, in this case, for instance, a firm A increased prices by 5%. In the last column, we can see what would happen in terms of sales. So if firm A uh, raised the prices by 5%, it would lose 
20 um, 20 20 percent of its sales um, thus it would lose sales from 100 to 80. Now note that most of these lost sales will be captured by firm B uh, 15 sales will go to five firm B uh, whereas firms C and D will get only three and two each. So in this scenario, in this type of market, let's imagine that we have a merger between firms A and B. Now, a merger between firms A and B would quite clearly create market power. A price increase of 5% by A will lead to only a loss of 2.5% of joint sales by A and B. So the fact that firm B would capture most of the lost sales of firm A means that it is now profitable for the entity AB following a merger to raise the prices of A. This is clearly to the detriment of consumers, and so this type of merger should be challenged under the horizontal merger guidelines. Now, if we are to consider another possible merger scenario, for instance, a merger between A and D, uh, this merger would not create market power, as a price increase of 5% in the prices of A would lead to a loss of 9% in joint A and D sales. So the price increase of A is not profitable. So what do we get out of this? Well, re look at that, uh, remember that the merger between A and B and the merger between A and D involve the creation of the same market share. Okay, both combinations would result in a pre-merger 50% market share. However, because B's products are closer substitutes to A than D's products, products produced by firm D, uh, a merger between A and B would be highly anti-competitive, whereas a merger between A and D would not. So let us now look at coordinated effects. In the air two judgments, um, the General Court has uh, stated the requirements in order to establish whether or not a merger is likely to give rise to coordinated effects. First, it is necessary that each member of the dominant oligopoly has the ability to know how the other members are behaving in order to monitor whether or not they're adopting the same common policy. That is to say, there has to be sufficient transparency in the market for firms to be aware of the competitive actions of their, um, in this case, their cooperative rivals. And collusion is more likely where it is simple to achieve a consensus on the conditions of coordination. In the example I showed you earlier where we had four mobile operators and there was a merger and so we would have three mobile operators with the same market share, that's the type of case where because they have the same market share, it's not necessary that it is exactly the same, but if they have a sufficiently close market share, then each of them is likely to have the same price maximization um, objective as the others, and so it is simpler to, simpler to achieve coordination. Um, secondly, um, the situation of, of tacit coordination has to be sustainable over time. So this means that there has to be an incentive to keep to this common discipline. And so each member of the dominant oligopoly has to be aware that if they deviate from the common action, if it acts in a highly competitive manner, then you know this would provoke an identical action by the others. And so this would um, uh, eliminate the benefits from deviation. Finally, the foreseeable reaction of current <clears throat> and future competitors, as well as of consumers, uh, must not jeopardize the results expected from the common policy in order for coordinated effects to um, occur or to occur successfully. So we looked at market share, we looked at um, HHIs, um, we looked at the types of effects, um, there are additional um, uh, factors that the Commission has to take into account in its uh, economic analysis of uh, a significant impediment to effective competition. One of them is barriers to entry. So these are still structural characteristics of the market, uh, 
barriers to entry, as the Commission calls them, uh, as it defines them, are these specific features of the market which give incumbent firms advantages over potential uh, rivals. And these may be legal obstacles, preferential access by the incumbent firms to raw materials, essential facilities, innovation and R&D, intellectual property rights, or economies of scale and scope, network externalities, brand reputation, consumer loyalty, etc. All of these make it harder for uh, new entrants to challenge the position of um, the current incumbents. The Commission also looks at a set of compensating factors, and the analysis of barriers to entry serves precisely to assess whether post-merger the entry of new or potential competitors is likely, timely, and sufficient. Um, likely in the sense that it would be sufficiently probable at post-entry prices and taking into account what the um, incumbents might respond by lowering prices, um, it has to be timely, so it has to predictably occur within a period of two years. And it has to be sufficient to deter the price increases, that is, of sufficient scope and magnitude to deter these price increases. The Commission also looks at buyer power. Even with a, co a situation where we have a cooperative oligopoly, if there is a monopsonist buyer, the monopsonist buyer may be able to act strategically to prevent this uh, uh, oligopoly from uh, increasing prices. And last we have the so-called efficiency defense, which is uh, based on uh, the uh, pioneer work by Oliver Williamson, a Nobel Prize winner economist, in a paper that he wrote in 1968. So the efficiency defense is related to possible efficiency gains resulting from the merger outweighing the possible anti-competitive effects, thus leading to net benefits to consumers. Now, in order to establish an efficiency defense, it is necessary for the party, the notifying parties to show that the merger will, res will result in benefits to consumers. Now, in order to create benefits to consumers, these have to consist in a reduction of marginal or variable costs. A reduction in fixed costs, for instance, would not shift the supply curve as a reduction of marginal costs would to a price where output was uh, larger than the output before the merger and more efficient because it, the output increases at a, uh, at a lower cost. These benefits would also have to be merger specific. Uh, they cannot, be, if they can be achieved, through uh, other means ra other, rather than a merger, then they would not be merger specific. So the uh, parties have to show that these benefits are adequate uh, in terms that re result really from the merger and could not be achieved otherwise, and they have to be proportional, that there's no least restrictive alternative to achieving um, these benefits. Finally, there are often when we hear of a merger, the merging parties will announce that the transaction will create enormous cost savings, um, that it will create synergies between the firms, but often these claims are unsubstantiated. And so in order to establish an efficiency defense before the Commission, um, these um, efficiency gains have to be verifiable both in terms of their probability as well as their magnitude. Uh, the burden of proof, obviously, is on the notifying parties. Because we're weighing costs and benefits to consumers, the Commission applies a sliding scale approach. So the larger the magnitude of likely anti-competitive effects, the stronger the, the evidence of efficiency gains necessary to outweigh them. A final issue um, to cover in this video is that of causality. Now, we're comparing the state of competition Y before the merger with the state of competition X, what we expect to be the state of competition following the merger. However, if the state of competition from Y to X deteriorates 
as a result of some other factor other than the merger, then we have an issue of causality. We cannot attribute that deterioration of the state of competition to the merger. And that's where the so-called failing firm defense comes in. This is a defense that parties may provide to justify a concentration that would apparently create a significant impediment to competition. The Commission sets out three cumulative requirements. The allegedly um, failing firm would exit the market in the near future due to financial hardship, if not for the acquisition by the notifying party. Uh, secondly, the parties have to demonstrate that there's no less anti-competitive alternative acquisition by some other prospect prospective buyer in the market. And finally, uh, in the absence of the merger, the failing firm's assets would inevitably leave the market. And so it's only under these very rigorous conditions that the Commission is willing to allow a merger under the so-called failing firm defense. Okay, and this concludes um, this video. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about the uh, non-horizontal merger guidelines, so uh, vertical and conglomerate mergers. So hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in class to discuss it. Bye.